but if you're a working person, you probably can. Um, there was also a, you know, a, a, to, to show you what a, a sham uh, this act was, there's a, a really hilarious moment um, in uh, oral argument where talking about the burdens this imposed on the right to choose, um, Justice Kagan led attorneys through for the state of Texas through an interesting succession. She said, you know, on this day, HB2 went into effect, right? And on the next day, this many abortion clinics closed. And now there are seven. Um, I think that's as close to a causal relationship as you can possibly find. But uh, to show you sort of how weak the dissents were here, most, most of the dissents focused on the fact that there wasn't enough evidence in the record that HB2 had caused clinics to close, even though they all closed the day after. You know, there wasn't just a bad thunderstorm that day. Um, Justice Ginsburg, um, who really was central in founding the ACLU's Women's Rights Project, was ACLU attorney before being on the Supreme Court and on the D.C. Circuit, um, and is in, you know, largely responsible for uh, the entire um, uh, jurisprudence that forbids sex discrimination under the 14th Amendment from her time as an attorney practicing in the Supreme Court in a one-page concurrence succinct, succinctly stated that given the realities of the safety of abortion procedures, it is beyond rational belief that HB2 could genuinely protect the health of women, and certainly that the law would simply make it more difficult for them to obtain abortions. So you might have noticed that Justice Ginsburg is kind of done um, pussyfooting around uh, anymore, and it's just gonna now call it like she sees it, um, and this was uh, certainly an evidence of that. The ACLU in this case, with the Wisconsin and Alabama affiliates, filed an amicus brief at the Supreme Court in support of whole women's health, um, first pointing out that three district courts in those states had heard similar challenges and reached a consensus that the admitting privileges requirement is a solution in search of a problem unless that problem is access to abortion itself. And second, asserting that, that when a medical justification is given for abortion restrictions, courts have a duty to determine whether the law in fact furthers the objective it purports to advance. You very much see those lines of thought running through Justice Breyer's majority opinion um, for the court. But again, um, Justice Kennedy had been in the majority on most post-Casey uh, cases of holding or voting to uphold abortion restrictions, so him crossing over is pivotal, uh, is the fifth vote here, uh, to get a ruling overturning the Fifth Circuit upholding uh, these restrictions. Um, so uh, a little bit of a surprise there as well. Final case I want to highlight is uh, Zubik versus Burwell. Um, uh, argued and um, decided after Justice Scalia's death. So under the Affordable Care Act, you know, there's an, you know, like how many Supreme Court cases have there been about the Affordable Care Act? And they're probably not done yet, but there'll be more. There'll be more. Uh, under the Affordable Care Act, uh, uh, employers are required to provide employees with health insurance that includes contraceptive coverage. Uh, the government uh, offers an exception for religious nonprofits, allowing them to opt out of their obligation to provide contraceptive coverage if they submit a one-page form noting their religious objection. Uh, once religious nonprofits opt out, the government steps in and works with insurers to provide employer, employees with contraceptive coverage. Plaintiffs in this case filed a lawsuit under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, arguing that the opt-out procedure was not the least restrictive means of accommodating their religious objections. So essentially that they argued that the act of providing written certification to the government uh, was what triggered the contraceptive coverage, making them complicit in a process that was contrary to their religious views. Um, you know, I mean, I, there's, there's like, I guess there's a point at which this would be a violation of RIFRA, you know, like going around and forcing nuns to hand out birth control no one, I think, in this room would be comfortable with this. But this is a very good faith effort to accommodate 
um, religious parties who um, control about one-sixth of the hospitals uh, in the United States of America. So this is not some sort of tiny little issue. Um, this basically just says fill out a form, a one-page form, and then we will take it from there. Uh, and they allege that that one-page form um, makes them complicit in providing uh, contraceptive coverage. Okay. Um, the vast majority of circuits, um, circuit courts, which is the level below the Supreme Court, had uh, upheld this provision uh, as a reasonable accommodation of uh, religious nonprofits. The Eighth Circuit, which sort of vies with the Fifth Circuit for being the most conservative circuit in the United States. The Fifth Circuit's um, Texas, uh, Louisiana, and Mississippi. Mississippi. Arkansas, I think, is actually in the eighth, but you, you, you smell what we're stepping in here. Um, uh, the, the, I think the eighth is Nebraska and the Dakotas and maybe Arkansas is in there as well. Um, so the Eighth Circuit found that this was a violation of RIFRA, and at that point the Supreme Court stepped in because there's something called a circuit split where you have the lower courts differing on this issue. But it was really like, I think it was like six to one um, on circuits dealing with this issue. Um, so without addressing the merits of either argument, the court directed, uh, uh, well, so first, after argument, the court requested additional briefing, which never happens, or very rarely happens. And what they sought additional briefing on was, to quote from their requested additional briefing, whether contraceptive coverage could be provided to, to petitioner's employees um, through a petitioner's insurance companies without any such notice from the petitioner. So is there a way to get rid of this one page form um, and make this work? Ask for further briefing on it. There was a further briefing that was submitted. Um, and at that point, without weighing in on the merits of the controversy, um, they sent it back uh, in a per curiam decision reflecting all eight justices to the circuit courts and essentially said, okay, so everybody told us that this might be able to work, that they could do this without the one page thing, so y'all should give them some time to, to try to work that out. Um, and somebody, I think, you know, appropriately labeled this as the Supreme Court's foray into uh, alternative dispute resolution. Um, it's a sort of an ADR process, you know, like, but it was, it was the biggest signal along with USV Texas that they, they can't operate in the typical fashion with only eight justices. Uh, because asking for additional briefing and then essentially saying give them time to try to work it out um, is not the way things typically operate. Um, uh, somebody snarkily noted, underlined one thing, you know, that, that, that said, you know, the party should be given adequate time to try to reach compromise. And somebody sort of underlined that passage um, and said, preferably until around mid-2017, uh, when we have a ninth justice. Um, justice Sotomayor wrote a concurrence uh, with uh, Justice um, Ginsburg uh, that, you know, warned courts of appeals below uh, not to take this per curiam as being uh, anything more than uh, a non-substantive uh, decision. There were courts of appeals, the Eighth Circuit, who had previously taken a, a similar per curiam and said, well, this actually means that they basically said that there's a, uh, a valid right under RIFRA here. There is a RIFRA issue. And Sotomayor and, K and Ginsburg were saying, we didn't reach the merits of this issue. Do not interpret this as us reaching the merits of this issue. This is a nothing decision from a substantive standpoint. Um, and, and went to great lengths to note that the court's opinion was not endorsing uh, that the petitioner's argument that contraceptive coverage should be provided through a separate insurance policy with separate enrollments. Um, as such separate contraceptive only policies do not currently exist. Uh, and she further noted that requiring women to affirmatively opt in to such services, which um, those challenging the rules suggested should occur, 
was precisely the type of barrier to the delivery of preventative services that Congress sought to eliminate through the Affordable Care Act. The, AC, the ACLU filed a, a an amicus brief in support of the government here, um, and the brief focused on the important lessons of history, to use its language, um, and that being that as our society has moved towards greater equality for racial minorities and women, it has rejected the notion that religion can be used to justify discrimination in the marketplace. Uh, as the court has recognized, the, the women's ability to control their reproductive capacities is essential to their participation in society and to their social and political equality. Um, and that the ACA's uh, contraceptive rule targets, again quoting from the brief, a remaining vestige of sex discrimination. And as such, the court should not allow the petitioners to exempt themselves um, from the rule on the basis of religious liberty. So those are the eight cases that I wanted to highlight. Um, I talked for more than an hour, um, uh, which again, I wanna highlight that Brandy told me I could do. Um, so if you have problems here, they should be taken up with Brandy, um, not with me. Um, but I hope that that was um, informative and, and useful. I'd love to open it up to, to questions and conversation about these eight cases, about any other uh, cases that were decided at the Supreme Court last term. Maybe I'll know about them. Maybe I won't. Um, any cases that are likely to head up to the Supreme Court in the foreseeable future, um, and relatedly, uh, the cases that um, that we have, uh, that we're participating in in the ACLU of North Carolina right now, I mean, two of those that I'll just flag are ones that have been on the front page of the Charlotte Observer recently. Obviously, the HB2 uh, litigation that we have here, where we were in court last Monday, uh, as well as our challenge to House Bill 589, which imposed a number of voting uh, suppression uh, measure, measures that were struck down um, by the Fourth Circuit. Uh, a, a week ago last Friday, um, and which is right now on appeal to, uh, or about to be on appeal to the United States Supreme Court. So well, thanks, well, thanks for your indulgence. Questions? Um, well, what I, so let me, let me give a little. Yeah, yeah, so what, so Dick's asking what I would predict in regards to the voting case. Um, let me provide a little background just so we're all operating from the same place. Um, we challenged uh, the elimination of a week of early voting, the elimination of same-day registration, the elimination of pre-registration, the elimination of out-of-precinct balloting, and the requirement of a voter ID uh, as violative of the 14th Amendment and the Voting Rights Act. This is where I'm going to stand on my soapbox and say, please do not call this the voter ID bill. I say this to everyone, you're doing the other side a favor when you call it the voter ID bill. That is the tip of the iceberg here uh, and um, in no way the only impact from 589. The other measures um, are similarly pernicious. Um, and the fact of the matter is they call it voter ID because voter ID polls a little bit better than eliminating a week of early voting because everybody likes early voting because it makes life easier for everybody. Um, we lost at the district court. Um, we were not surprised to lose at the district court. We, uh, the Fourth Circuit reversed. Uh, you get a three-judge panel, 15 judges at the Fourth Circuit. You get a, unanimous, you get a randomly assigned three-judge panel. We won 3-0 last Friday. They, uh, we held that this violated um, the voting rights uh, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act because it had a disproportionate effect on African American voters um, in the state. We also said that it violated both Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act and the 14th uh, Amendment because it intentionally discriminated against African American voters. Um, and central to that was uh, evidence that was undisputed in the record that after the Shelby County decision from the Supreme Court, which removed the preclearance requirement where North Carolina had to get federal approval to change their voting procedures, immediately thereafter, they started talking about how they're gonna run the full bill. Uh, Senator Rucho from your neck of the woods talking about can't help himself, I'm gonna run the full bill. 
and then they produce this 58-page monstrosity that does all of the things that I just uh, referenced. But in the interim, after Shelby County, they ran um, demographic data on all of these changes and saw that all of these changes would disproportionately burden African-American community. That the African-American community disproportionately voted early, disproportionately used same-day registration, disproportionately voted out of precinct, disproportionately used pre-registration, and disproportionately did not have IDs uh, that, would that would qualify for the voter ID provision. They made sure of that by stripping out public assistance photo identification from the original version of the bill after the Shelby County decision to make sure that African Americans would have more trouble with the voter ID provision. I mean, this is some serious villainy here. Like, let's not sugarcoat this. Like, this was a, as the Fourth Circuit very rightly said, a surgical effort to make it more difficult for African Americans to vote. Um, and they, the Fourth Circuit held that this was intentional discrimination and wiped out all of those um, suppressive uh, efforts. Uh, the state sought um, to uh, have that decision stayed by the Fourth Circuit. The Fourth Circuit declined to do so. Surprise, surprise. Um, and they have indicated that they are going to um, appeal that to the Supreme Court and seek an emergency stay. Um, the legislative leaders, Bro uh, Senator Berger and Speaker Moore, I don't know if you read their statement after the Fourth Circuit's decision. If you haven't, you should because it's breathtaking. Um, it says these three democratically appointed, I'm paraphrasing, but not by much, um, democratically appointed uh, legislators are attempting, um, are ignoring precedent um, and just uh, trying to help. And we can't help but wonder, is the way they phrase it, if they're trying to help fellow Democrats, Hillary Clinton and Roy Cooper, to steal the election in November. Um, I mean, you know, to, to you know, uh, one of the, the, the judges is from Brevard, North Carolina, originally lives in Pickens, South Carolina, was appointed to the federal district court bench by President George W. Bush originally, you know? Um, it's just amazing. To get an emergency stay of this decision, before the November election, you need to have five justices vote to give you the stay. So if there was a 4-4 split here, the Fourth Circuit's decision would remain in effect, and the injunction barring these provisions from being in effect would remain in effect for the November election. Therefore, you know, personal, you know, there's something called the Purcell Doctrine in voting rights, which says that we don't like to meddle a great deal at the very last minute with how elections are going to be held. The state board, to their credit, has taken steps uh, to you know, change what the procedures are going to be based on this decision. The Supreme Court stepping in now would complicate things uh, immensely. So I think Purcell argues against granting a stay at this point. Justice Breyer or some other of the liberals would have to walk over and join the conservatives to grant such a stay. Um, I don't know that even Justice Kennedy or Justice Roberts under Purcell would be interested in granting a stay here. I feel very confident there won't be a stay uh, issued. But I'll, I'll, I'll want to caveat that with two different points. First, um, the, if any of y'all have followed the uh, Gavin Grimm versus Gloucester County case out of Virginia, which is a transgender uh, male student who had been utilizing the restroom that accorded with his gender identity in Gloucester County, Virginia for seven weeks before his school board voted to not allow him to do so any further, despite the fact that there had been no problems with him doing so. We won that case at the Fourth Circuit uh, as well, and the Supreme Court did stay that injunctive relief that would have aided Gavin last week on a 5-3 vote with Justice Breyer crossing over and joining the conservatives. So it's not beyond the realm of possibility. Breyer couched it as a courtesy vote. Um, and I think that again points to the fact that the court's not functioning as it typically would if it had nine justices. Um, and also he referred back to the fact that conservatives had not given him courtesy stays on death penalty cases previously. Because you only need four justices 
to grant cert to review a circuit court decision, but you need five to grant a stay. So in the past, we've had circumstances where the liberals on the court have granted cert on behalf of uh, a, death, a defendant facing the death penalty who is not there anymore once the case makes it to the Supreme Court because he is executed in the meantime. And I think Breyer wants to stop that. So, but getting in the weeds here, I don't think in this case that there will be a stay uh, issued because elections are their own thing. I do want to highlight for you one thing that y'all need to be very attuned to here in Mecklenburg County and that we're attuned to throughout the states, the state about that. Um, there was something, so they cut down from 17 to 10 days early voting. Um, that's a big problem. But uh, Josh Stein, who's a, been in the Senate, uh, ameliorated that a little bit by passing something that, require, uh, that required an hour match and said, you have to, in 2016, get as many hours as you had in 2012, just in this 10-day window. Now, we had expert testimony why that would not be as good as what we had um, uh, in 2012 with 17 days and two Sundays, uh, but it would have been something. The Fourth Circuit's decision wiped out the hour match requirement. So we're now back to 17 days, but we don't have any requirement to have as many days as we had in 2012. We've already seen some counties talk about cutting early voting sites a great deal during the early voting period. I'm not joking. The guy who runs Civitas out of Raleigh suggested that Mecklenburg County should just open one early voting site at its county board of elections for 17 days and be done with it, with that. I mean, how, can you imagine what would happen in Mecklenburg County if there was one early voting site? 56% of people voted early in 2012, and you're gonna try to, you can't shuffle 56% of the voting population through the County Board of Elections. Um, but that's how extreme the rhetoric is on the other side. So please, you know, when the County Board of Elections meets here in Mecklenburg County, you'll have a good director, Michael Dickerson, who has talked about a very responsible way of handling this and what he has suggested, which I think is the right way to handle this, is you already had a good 10-day plan. Just keep the 10-day plan and then open the County Board of Elections for five extra days to satisfy the 17-day requirement. So you open a week early and then you keep the same robust 10-day plan that you had previously. Why on earth would you not just do that as opposed to I mean, that's something that would do havoc to everybody's vote, regardless conservative, liberal, otherwise. I mean, that's crazy, but please monitor that. Be aware of when the County Board of Elections is, is going to meet and, and communicate uh, to folks that that's unacceptable. Did you? Yeah, the Chief Justice can decide all by himself. He can. Um, that's not the typical practice. They usually almost always refer those cases to the, the full court. Um, each um, justice has a circuit that they're responsible for uh, in regards to things like emergency stays. And our justice here in the Fourth Circuit, we're in the Fourth Circuit, the Fourth Circuit is the, the Carolinas, the Virginias, and Maryland. Um, and our justice is Chief Justice Roberts. So he could have granted the stay as he clearly wanted to do in the Gavin Grimm case all by himself. But the court can then undo that stay if they, so cho if they chose to do so. There's a very sort of crazy story about Justice um, Douglas back during the Vietnam War uh, stopping very briefly the Nixon administration's bombing of Cambodia by issuing a stay all by himself. And then the rest of the court was like, no, you can't do that and undid it like later that day. Um. My question, I'm not sure, this is my first time here, and I find that coming to these things, right, things are given a definition, and I'm, I'm trying to be clear on what North Carolina perceives as qualified for the definition of discrimination. Now you have a big thing with the race, the sex, the uh, are there any other ways to define in North Carolina what discrimination, uh, what would be discrimination? Because I understand the statute, I only talk about four things. Yeah. So how would you define discrimination? Well, it's a really good question. Um, 
and prior to House Bill 2, and you know, the rejoinder to what happened here in Charlotte with the city council trying to protect the entire community, uh, prior to that, the state had not had any protected classes, um, uh, protected from discrimination in employment or public accommodations. Uh, public accommodations typically being things like hotels and restaurants. Um, and the reason they didn't have them were largely because um, we weren't going to adopt in North Carolina more progressive protections, more expansive protections. So there were already federal protections that covered race, sex, um, national origin, um, age, age, disability. disability. We, we've, <laughs> right. I'm, I'm yep. And I, th I, th I, 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 pregnancy is a form of sex right, right, right. So, so there were all these, and we have a better expert. You should just go ask her when we're done <laughs> to get the real answer. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so, um, and I, I hope this provides an answer, but you push back if it doesn't, because I do want to answer the question. So, before HB two, there was there was no state protection, really for protected classes because the feds had it covered um, and while imperfect we weren't you know some states go further than that than what the federal protections are um, and will adopt protections in employment and public accommodations that are more expansive than that North Carolina is never going to do that or it, at least historically is not going to do that so we leaned back on the federal statutes um, and there was no reason to really adopt state statutes if they weren't going to be broader what HB 2 did is they adopted um, anti, you know, they made protected classes on a state level for the first time. But my understanding is that they entirely mirrored what um, was uh, prohibited discrimination in federal law, except instead of using the word sex, they used the word biological sex. And the reason they did that was because some courts have in, uh, interpreted sex to prohibit discrimination based on being transgender. And they have included sex, uh, prohibited discrimination based on sexual orientation um, pursuant to the prohibition on uh, discrimination on sex. So when North Carolina adopted these other measures like the prohibition on race discrimination, they weren't giving us anything. We already had that through the federal government. But by adopting a protection only of biological sex, they were essentially putting an exclamation point at the end of the sentence and saying, LGBT community, we don't mean you. We do not mean you. Um, uh, so, you know, they've tried to say, you know, they're expanding protections. They weren't expanding protections. They were trying to make very clear who was not protected and trying and effectively overruling what Charlotte had done to offer protections to the LGBT uh, community. But the broader question, you know, like what, if, you know, first there's a lot of, and there continues to be litigation and our litigation against HB2, in fact, largely turns on whether discrimination against trans folks is sex discrimination. And I, there's a real good body of law, including the GG case from the Fourth Circuit that says that it is. But that's something that's still up for debate in the federal courts. Um, whether it includes sexual orientation is up for debate in the federal courts as well right now. There are some states, there are 19 states, I believe, that have gone further and made plain that they prohibit discrimination against the LGBT community. Um, and there also is a federal equality act that would make explicit that such discrimination against the LGBT community is impermissible. Um, uh, and sort of, so, you know, f answer that question once and for all. Does that, is that, does that drive out what you were asking about? Yeah, yeah, I, I, I was just, I was just really confused because when I looked at the statute, there were like four specific things, and I'm like, well, if you know, fit up under one of those four things, how could you conclude that it's not sexual orientation? Because you know, I don't know what the four things are, but right. you know, it seems like there's four things that are different. Right. 
Well, and, and here's, a, here's another key point, and I uh, should know better than to delve into this with an employment attorney in the room, but I'm gonna try nonetheless, uh, is that the original version of HB2 eliminated uh, the state cause of uh, uh, court action based on work, uh, you know, discrimination in the workplace. And it was, in, it was actually, in my understanding, in some instances could offer broader protections than the federal government uh, did because it said discrimination that was contrary to public policy and fleshed out exactly what that meant. It took away you know, the ability of you, uh, the original version of HB2, to sue in state court based on being fired because you're black or because you're Jewish or because you were you know, born in India. Um, they, you know, the, at the end of this short session, you know, the, 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 the newspapers covered it as they restored the state workplace cause of action. They gave us back around 30 cents on the dollar. You used to have a three year statute of limitations to bring those actions, now you have a year. And, you know, there's a very famous case uh, involving Lily Ledbetter that I'm sure some people are familiar with in the case where she worked at Goodyear and she didn't know for years that she had been paid less because she was a woman uh, until somebody anonymously told her about it. Uh, oftentimes that's how it works in especially close-knit workplaces is that uh, you know, you don't figure out that that discrimination had occurred until a couple months later or years down the road. So changing to a one-year statute of limitations is a big deal. And also if you're a working person, you know, what happens after you lose your job? is the vast majority of folks don't run out and hire a lawyer the next day. They look for a job because they have to put food on the table. Um, they don't have the resources to get an attorney. Or if they do, it's entirely contingent upon bringing money in the door via a new job. So it's entirely unfair and unreasonable to cut down the, the statute of limitations for no uh, good reason. There and it makes everybody less secure in their workplace in, in North Carolina. Yeah, this is a very interesting question, right? Um, yeah, let, let, I'll, I'll, I'll restate the question, yeah. So Brandy's asking a very good question, which is essentially, um, we've made a great deal of progress in recent years um, uh, in regards to realizing, for example, full lived equality for LGBT folks, but also um, you know, protecting women in the workplace, uh, abortion rights, et cetera. Um, what is the worst case scenario that could come out of the 2016 election. Um, well, so so let me let me let me. I'll flag two different points here. So first, there's obviously a vacancy right now. Um, in addition, um, Justice Ginsburg is over the age of 80. Justice Kennedy is almost 80. I, I believe Justice Breyer is 78. Um, uh, there are the next four years. Uh, uh, the president could have three uh, nominees in addition to the current vacancy, which could very well still be open. Um, so, you know, the future of the court uh, is very much uh, at stake. Um, it's hard to imagine someone being as bad as Justice Scalia on LGBT rights and abortion rights. Uh, I mean, uh, um, but, what if, what if Justice Kennedy gets replaced by somebody more conservative like Justice Roberts or Justice Alito? 
What if Justice Ginsburg is replaced by that sort of person? That would be a sea change. Um, but what the, you know, I think that's the easy point to understand, right? I think the more interesting point is what you pushed at, um, which is that no one questions whether Merrick Garland is qualified to be on the Supreme Court. Um, you, uh, he might not fit within your ideological mold of a preferred justice. I, I mean, I know that there are a lot of people on the left who wished he was more to the left. Uh, but you can't doubt that he is a qualified individual. Um, he has a sterling reputation on the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals. Um, you know, you should, if anybody wants to read about the relationships he has with his clerks, you know, you will feel very good that this is a good human being. He also has, there was an NPR piece that like led me to cry driving back home from work one day that some of y'all might have heard where he volunteers every week at a DC public school um, and was their commencement speaker recently at the elementary school graduation. Um, my point is, the Republicans have not allowed a vote longer than anyone has been waiting for a vote in the history of the Supreme Court on someone that everyone agrees is entirely, is entirely qualified to be on the Supreme Court. That is unprecedented on top of unprecedented. Uh, it's one thing to vote somebody down. To not give somebody a vote is unprecedented. The idea that, for example, Donald Trump would become president and fill that vacancy when he became president and that the Democrats would just be like, sure, looks like a good justice, fully qualified, is insane. <laughs> there will be a tit-for-tat escalation that will be unlike anything that we've seen before. This is, um, this is a, a, you know, a, a deep, dark spiral that you would go into um, where it's hard to imagine Democrats really being satisfied with anybody if they have more than 40 seats in the Senate who's very much more conservative than Merrick Garland. So you could, you know, I think the worst situation for the Republic is that, you know, what if something happens to another justice? You could very quickly get down to seven or even six justices on the Supreme Court because there's no obligation to have a particular number on the Supreme Court. Yeah. And so what specifically what would happen if, if one party is in power and the other party is running Congress? One party is executive. Yeah. So just I mean, do we just have a standstill to show off? Yeah, I mean you could. Okay. You you could have a you could entirely have a situation where uh, if Trump became president and Democrats still had uh, similar you know, we're not in the majority in the Senate, but had forty or 45, 48 uh, seats in the Senate, that they would uh, um, not vote for closure on any of them to allow a vote to go up. I think at that point, what would be likely to happen is that Republicans would do the nuclear option and say you could no longer filibuster um, Supreme Court nominees, and then they would push forward a Supreme Court nominee, you know, 52, 48 or something like that. And at that point, you really do get to the point where it looks like politicians in robes. But your, your broader point is, you know, the, the Republicans have allowed some lower court um, justices to go through, ju judges to go through while um, blockading Garland. On the one hand, that's good because there are vacancies that need to be filled. On the other hand, it puts to lie this idea that they can't handle judicial appointments during an election year. Like, President Obama is still the president, like it or not. And I mean, this is not something North Carolina is immune to. Um, we in the Eastern District of North Carolina, which runs from Raleigh east to the coast, have had a federal judicial vacancy for um, 10 years. There's been a district court seat that has been open there for 10 years. Um, president Obama has now nominated two African-American women uh, one a former prosecutor, one uh, a former member of the North Carolina Supreme Court, uh, Patricia Timmons Goodson, 
uh, for the seat. Uh, Senator Burr has not turned in the blue slip, which is the requirement to get a vote. Uh, the eastern portion of North Carolina is the most heavily African-American portion of North Carolina. It's about 35% black. There's never been an African-American judge on the eastern district of North Carolina in 2016. And two undoubtedly qualified judges have been nominated and have gone nowhere um, the entirety of President Obama's tenure. So this is a problem. So two more questions and then we'll wrap up so people won't throw tomatoes at me. Three more questions, but they have to be very, they're very quick. It's a, it's a bad, it's a, it's a questionable start, but I'm going to let you go. The, the elimination of straight ticket voting was yeah. not part of this lawsuit, was it wasn't part of the law. Uh, so is there a chance that a lawsuit can be brought against the elimination of straight ticket voting on the same ground as the voter suppression? Yes, uh, and a similar elimination of straight ticket voting uh, was uh, struck down in Michigan recently, so I know that there are some people who are looking at that. Uh, I, I think people are looking at it. I think that based on the Purcell Doctrine, there's no lawsuits that are going to get filed at this point in the year that are, that are expected to get decided such that they could impact the November election because we're just too close to the election. No, no, no. That's a good question. It's a really good question. Okay. Steve, you get the last one. Uh, you're completely right. Um, and for, and for a party that claims to be originalist in its interpretation of the Constitution, it's bizarre that they do something like that anyway. Right. Right. So I'll take this moment to remind everyone that the ACLU is a nonpartisan organization. Um, having said that, uh, you know, I think there's a lot to what you're saying there. Um, I'll say a couple things. First, they have very much couched their opposition. To, just, to Judge Garland on the fact that we're in an election year, um, which I think is a ridiculous argument um, and an argument that is in no way uh, jibes with the constitutional text. Having said that, I think they've boxed themselves into a corner because at a certain point, it's not an election year and you gotta go. So, you know, I think that in 2017, uh, I, I would anticipate that that will go away. Let's hope. I, I mean, the, the interesting dynamic here will be whether the Republican, if, I think that, you know, based on my reading of Nate Silver, uh, if the election were held today, Hillary probably wins and the Democrats win back the Senate. Um, and to me, the interesting question becomes this, uh, do the Republicans rush Garland through the lame duck session of the Senate in December before Hillary becomes president because they are fearful that Hillary will nominate someone who is more progressive than Judge Garland. Um, you know, I actually, I don't know what, what Mitch McConnell will do in regards to that. I, he doesn't return my calls. Um, but I actually think that even if they don't do that, that uh, pre a President Clinton would be likely to name Judge Garland just because he would move through very quickly and it would be essentially painless. Um, and also based on the fact that it's widely expected that justice, you know, some uh, combination of justices Ginsburg, Breyer, and Kennedy will likely retire in the first term. So get Garland on there, get the court back functioning, and then, you know, have a more progressive pick for the next one. Yeah, he, she, would have to, she would have to nominate Garland herself. It, it, like, his nomination will expire at the end of this Senate. But my guess, my completely uneducated, just best guess would be that she would do that just because she's going to have plenty on her plate in January anyway, so why not just take, you know, something you can get through like that? And she'll have other opportunities, but we'll see. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it.
Thank you, Chris. That was a great review. Uh, quite a few positives, a few less positive notes, but overall a great review. Thank you very much, and thank you for coming. I hope you got something out of it, and I uh, look forward to seeing you our meeting. Our next membership meeting, we're moving up to September 25th. It's going to be on voting rights, and we're doing it in, at least in part because with the election so close, we want to give people information as soon as we can. Uh, we'll have an expert on uh, what's going on around here uh, regarding voting rights and the various decisions that have been coming down lately. So um, September 25th, same time, 7 to 9 p.m. here. Thank you very much.